Praise God, wonderful morning this morning. So appreciate our brother's ministry. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, the Gospel of John in chapter 4, so honored to have been asked to minister here by Pastor Brown and so appreciate him and, and his character. Uh, impressive, powerful man of God, and I deeply respect him. Uh, I, <clears throat> is the title of my sermon up there? Uh, okay, there it is. Um, sheep in wolves' clothing. Uh, and so, uh, of course, that's not what we normally think of. Huh? We, uh, uh, Jesus had talked about um, the Pharisees, the religious people, uh, uh, being uh, sheep in wolves' clothing, uh, that uh, they are, they look like they're sheep, <laughs> they, they look like they're legit, but there's wickedness and uh, underneath Paul writes about or speaks about in Acts 20 ravenous wolves but then there's this other part and I know <laughs> the Bible doesn't specifically use this terminology but the idea of sheep in wolves clothing in other words people that appear to you outwardly that they're bad people uh, and yet they're actually real legitimate sheep and this has to do many times with how we process people but more often it's how we've processed past relationships and there's this psychological term, and I'm not going to be talking about psychology. I'm talking about this is just how people explain. This is something in human nature, like this is what we do. And it's called transference. It's like how some person has treated you in the past, then you begin to view other people through the lens of how they have treated you. And so someone who is a sheep that, and we're talking about negative treatment here, of course, how someone has treated you then becomes imposed and you are, you're viewing people who are for you, who are crucial to your destiny and future and development and your marriage, because you might be married to uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing, especially if you've had another marriage perhaps in the past. And so uh, we're, we're looking at a very familiar passage here, uh, um, and there is no doubt, I think, that as this dear woman is uh, being, uh, having an encounter with Jesus Christ, who I think we could all legitimately say is a good guy. Amen. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> uh, and yet, obviously, she is viewing him with great suspicion uh, because very, uh, the context tells us because obviously she's had some issues in her past. So let's look uh, then at... Uh, we're, we'll begin at verse 4. Uh, uh, but he, G, that's Jesus, needed to go through Samaria. And I've always uh, just been moved by that. You, you know, is that, just the, is that just the shortest route? Or did he need to go for this dear woman, right? That's what, that's what he needed to do. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. 
Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied from his journey, thus sat by the well, it was about the sixth hour, a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his son, his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. We won't read the rest of the passage just in the interest of time, but we'll be alluding to that. Let's think about this issue of transference. And so I, uh, I saw a, a, a little book by this title and, and was just interested in the, in the terminology. It was actually written by a, a woman speaking out of an experience that she had while she was uh, in university. And uh, she developed a friendship with this other Christian woman and uh, just really felt like they were uh, kindred spirits, you know, and uh, just uh, connected very well and had a, had a great relationship and they were serving God together. And then uh, suddenly this uh, other woman uh, uh, moved away and she went on to other things and, uh, and now as uh, this woman is, the, the author is thinking about this relationship, she is thinking about all these areas of conflict where this woman has wronged her and she is she is looking at this woman and saying, she's just like my mother. She's just like my mother, who was not a, a great lady. And the reality is that this woman is absolutely nothing like her mother, had no characteristics at all like her, but uh, this, she's being stirred more and more with resentment and hurt and bitterness over these perceived conflicts. And so she began to talk to other people about all the ways that this woman had wronged her. And she got so stirred that she wrote a, a whole uh, epistle <laughs> to her based on Matthew chapter 11, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Matthew 18, Right, we got to deal with these things, and you've done this to me, and this to me, and, and, and you have this against me, and this against me, and so we need to sit down, like Matthew 18, and we need to, we need to settle this. And so she, the, the, the friend writes back and says, I'm not in conflict with you. Like, I don't feel any of those things. Those things haven't happened. But rather than accepting that, then she begins to gossip about her and slander the other, the other woman, gossiping and slandering, and she's like assaulting this woman, her friend that she thought was like a kindred spirit, and now she's tearing her down before all these mutual friends. And it dawns on her, wait, 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 wait a minute. This is a demon, right? This is a spirit. And I have made this relationship like an, like an idol, like this friendship, this is, this is going to be a close friendship with, for me. And, uh, and so, like I think we've heard this week, you know, thinking more about 
this relationship all the time and being moved by uh, the feeling of that rela relationship and the condition of that relationship more than God himself. And so uh, our relationship becomes an idol or our wounds or sense of, of grievance. Our sense of grievance becomes the thing that consumes us and fills our minds rather than God and the things of God. She renounced idolatry, right? She renounced it. Uh, uh, she repented of bitterness and resentment and, and suspicion, and she got free. As this friend, this friend was not a, a wolf. <laughs> she was a, a, a sheep. Transference in the uh, is defined the Baker Encyclopedia of Psychology. It says the term means literally to convey information or contact, content from one person, place, or situation into another. The usual pattern is for a person in the present to be experienced as though he or she were a person of the past. This transference, at least from a psychoanalytic point of view, is basically a repetition of an old object relationship in which attitudes and feelings, either positive or negative, pertaining to a former relationship, have been shifted on to a new person in the, ple in the present. And so it is, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that there's a dynamic that is working here as uh, this uh, woman is spoken to by the Lord Jesus Christ. She's a woman of Samaria. We learn... <laughs> Uh, from later in the uh, chapter, that she's had five different husbands and so given up on marriage that now she didn't even bother marrying the next guy, and so she's shacking up with this guy. And so, uh, so she's got some man issues. <laughs> and uh, whether all of these men were horrible men that she had to divorce, or maybe she was just how she viewed that, whatever. Obviously, like her experience with men has not been great uh, and has meant the, the shattering of five relationships and, a, and an unwillingness to commit to another one. So to walk away from that in, uh, in due time. But there's also like a, an ethnic or racial thing that's involved here. And certainly... Uh, it says uh, Jews and Samaritans, they don't have any relationship one, with one another. And so you know that, uh, you know, Jesus comes into Samaria at uh, one point in, in the Gospels and they reject him. And then uh, James and John, as you know, this, the wonderful loving Christians that they are, want to call down fire from heaven to, to burn them all for Jesus, of course. Uh, and... Uh, and, and so obviously, there, you know, there's, a, there's high emotion when it comes to the interactions. Uh, when I was in Almogordo, we, uh, we had uh, a wonderful move of God uh, on, the, on the air base there. And, uh, and people coming in, of, 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 you know, of different races of people. And uh, there's this... A uh, young woman that came in, she was in relationship with a, uh, one of the guys that had just gotten saved. They were already in a relationship, and she, uh, and she brought her. This is uh, African-American uh, people. And when she came in, right, she, uh, she just had, like, <laughs> hate and suspicion in her eyes, you know. But it was one of the most remarkable conversion experience if you've ever seen this it's so powerful and I and it's I saw it particularly twice in Almagoro that you see someone come down to pray in the sinner's prayer and when they have a face and after they pray the sinner's prayer they lift up and their face is different like something supernatural. We know salvation is supernatural, but it just such a, it's a, like a deliverance. 
Well, she had issues with white people. Her grandfather was lynched. Like, that's not an easy thing to process, right? You're, you're talking about like the worst kind of treatment that you can receive, no matter, not to mention whatever uh, things were imposed upon her just from the culture around her growing up in the South. But she got free, right? And they are, uh, they went out to Pioneer, didn't work out, and they're, they're today they're in the, the Chandler Church, right? He, I believe he's on the church council, right? They, you know, they, they went on for God. But it, it, it took that like a miracle, right? Like I'm, I, I cannot, I cannot view these people. I, I married them, right? Like the, it's like the, uh, but how, how strong that can be in human personality. She said, and the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman so uh, for for jews have no dealings with samaritans so here here is jesus right this is this is god incarnate this is the finest human being that's ever walked the earth this is a a, a man of compassion and grace and mercy and kindness like her future life and eternal destiny. Uh, he wants to assure to be a, a glorious thing. And he is treated like a Jewish male wolf, right? Like arm's distance. Why are you even talking to me? She is in danger of rejecting the Son of God. Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. He's sinless. And yet she transfers how she has been treated in the past upon him. I know what Jews are like. I've had my dealings with Jews. I know what men are like. They're all just in it for sex. They're just all in it to exploit. They're all, you know, I, I know I know men, or they, they say you love, they love you, and then they reject you. So I, 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 I get it. And so this is this experience in life where here is someone who can be such a blessing to you, but you view them from the lens of this other relationship. I was thinking about Hunan, you know, who, uh, 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 you know, David sends a, uh, uh, his, his, Hunan's father passes away, he was the king, and David sends two guys to him uh, to uh, just express condolences because uh, uh, Hunan's father had been a blessing to him uh, in the past. And so here's a man, that, you know, like he's grieving the loss of his father, certainly. He's just had the weight of the kingdom upon him. You know, here is an opportunity uh, for good relationship between himself and, uh, and the, the kingdom of Israel. But there were some suspicious people that began to tell Hunan, oh, they're only here. They're only here to spy out the land so they can come and conquer you. And so he, he responds in that way, humiliates them. The result of that is like these, this war, these battles that take place that kill like tens of thousands of people because you're going to view an expression of, of, of loyalty, of love, of appreciation. And, it, and your reaction is going to mean the death of thousands. And maybe we don't deal with thousands, but we can, we can so view relationships. And, I, and I'm talking really to focus 
on how you view your pastor many times and because of how you interpret him because of transference perhaps experience you've had with other men experience you've had with other men of another ethnicity right? Be, because of somebody you've experienced with an authority figure maybe even a religious figure in your life and that gets transferred you know Jesus is about to heal a paralytic and uh he says, you know, your sins are forgiven you. And, it, you know, he's going to bring redemption and, and help. And, and these religious people are uh, uh, assaulting him, criticizing him in their hearts. And he asks the question, and it's a question for, that every one of us needs to ask ourselves in relationship with people. Why think ye evil in your heart? Right, again, here's the Son of God. Here's a desperately needy human being. Are you going to heal his paralysis? Are you going to forgive his sins? Are you going to address the need? No, but you want to keep him because you, can, you view this wonderful life through the eyes of suspicion. Pride, rebellion. We often do this in our relationships. Misinterpret others because of past wrongs and past betrayals and wounds. And this is something that pastors need to battle ourselves. Because occasionally we get betrayed we get lied about. Right? We have things that are spoken about us and uh, they can be extremely painful sometimes that you've invested your, your life in and, uh, and have the, these are your converts sometimes and people that you've given an opportunity to do something for God and invested thousands of dollars in them to bless and serve and they turn on you and begin to lie about you and uh, all manner of evil and and for a pastor to to resist cynicism right to to think okay i'm not doing that for anybody anymore or any little thing somebody just asks a question and you see Judas, right? Like you see betrayal under every bush. Like it's like, no, you gotta, you gotta get the victory, man. You, you got to, you know, who's, who's got betrayed over the years more than Pastor Mitchell, you know? And yet again and again, despite all that has been said, all the rebellions, all the injustice, all the people that he gave his heart and resources and credibility to, he was still willing again and again to invest in people. And every person that he invested in was imperfect because that's the only kind there are. So, and pastors are often the targets of, from the people, right? Represent your father to you who was abusive or harsh. And uh, Pastor Mitchell would say, you know, when the, the people are angry at the gods, they throw rocks at the temple. And the temple happens to be Pastor so-and-so. And so uh, people take their anger <clears throat> at God at the pastor, they don't even realize that, right? It's somehow you have failed me. Like you said God was good, well, you know, what's, what's wrong? But I wanted to think here because um, what we, it, it, it's, it's not fun to recognize it. Uh, you know, we want to have compassion, certainly. 
on the wounds and hurts and wrongs that have happened to people's lives and not condemn people that have been through some very traumatic things. But there's no amount of trauma that justifies sin, right? Like, like we, have to, we have to get there. And that we've got this problem, right? And it's this thing right here. It's our hearts. And what the Bible tells us about this is that it likes to lie. And the person it likes to lie to the most is ourselves. Bible says that our hearts are deceitful above all things. <laughs> Does that include the devil? I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's it's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Or one translation says, "And there is no cure." And I don't think that that means that there's. Uh, there's, there's no way you'll, you'll ever recognize, but it, it does mean that can, you can never say, my heart will never be deceived again. That we, we have to recognize that. And so to recognize that how we are processing people can come out of not the hurt, but the, but the sin that hides behind that. Like pride. You know, the Bible says, with pride cometh contention. And so uh, you can say, and there could be a great validity, you know, you, you've been wronged, you've been hurt, and so you're uh, extra defensive, right? You're extra uh, careful, uh, you know. But there's also a point where it's very prideful for you to impose uh, bad character on people that have not demonstrated that bad character. And that you know, I, I know, I know people. No, you don't. You don't even know you. <laughs> and, and, and that's the issue. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I just, I want to make this statement, I didn't have him put it on the, in a quote, but it's really hard to get to know people. You can be married to somebody for years and you still don't fully get them. If you think you do, just ask your wife and she'll say, no, you don't, <laughs> you don't get me. But, and so, just to know, if you, we just, yeah, I know, I got them nailed. I've got them nailed. No, you don't. The people are really hard to get to know. Well, I'm not proud. I'm insecure. Well, check again. Just check again. And rebellion, right? Rebellion linked to pride, of course. You could have been wronged, but now is, is that the issue? Okay, you had a pastor that failed in some way or wounded you in, in, in some way. But your present pastor, that's, that's not he, right? Like, don't, don't do that. And don't let rebellion hide behind that. Pastor Greg did this, this series on rejection, very powerful the dynamic of rejection that uh, works in human personality and he makes a statement that a lot of rebels have a background of rejection so you can have compassion on the rejection but you you can't have compassion for the rebellion it's still a sin right that's not how you process rejection but there's one and and the, I, I i mentioned this or these you know i i know they're different but they overlap uh, but in many ways, the, these are the sins that we are blind to. I, I think we're blind to pride often, but we're blind to jealousy and envy. Like Pilate knew, the Jews delivered Jesus up for envy. The Jews didn't see that. 
The Jews thought they were doing the righteous thing. But it is, it's, it's something for you. If you've got an issue with someone and you have negative feelings, of course, we just say it's their fault I have negative feelings. No, it very likely could be jealousy and envy, right? That, and you just naturally react to that. There's a book um, by George Eliot called Middlemarch, and, I, and I'm, uh, it is, it's quite a story. It's quite an unfolding of human nature. Uh, and, uh, but there's a gentleman, uh, he's actually a, a minister, and he is a, a very insecure man, and he is, uh, you, you know, the main character, Dorothy, is this beautiful woman that just wanted to do something for God and married this loser. <laughs> she didn't know he was a loser. She thought he was a great scholar and will make an impact on the earth and I'm going to help him. But, but he, out of his own insecurity, is afraid she's, going to, she's seeing who he really is. And there's another guy that comes into this picture that she has no feelings for necessarily, but she, he gets jealous. And it, he's, he's going to... He knows he's older, right? He's much older than this woman, and, and she, he's going to die before she does. But she write, he writes in his will, like, she can have my, all my inheritance. And he had, like, you know, he was one of those guys. That, didn't they all in those novels? They had whole estates, you know. Uh, she can have it, but if she marries that guy, she gets nothing. And so, just the quote, Mr. Kasabin, this is the guy, indeed had not thoroughly represented those mixed reasons to himself. Irritated feeling with him, and this is talking about jealousy and envy. Irritated feeling with him, as with all of us, seeking rather for justification rather than self-knowledge. When we are upset with someone, we want to justify why we feel that way. We don't want to know why do I feel that way. We don't want to look inside here. But that's where the solution is. No matter whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, how do we process? And there's willfulness and control like this uh, in this book this woman she didn't get help from psychology she gets help from deliverance right this is a I recognize I've allowed a spirit and this is what Jesus offers to this woman a, a, a transformation it, we're talking about sheep and wolves clothing Jesus was the lamb in wolves clothing right he was the lamb of god in sheep's clothing think of jesus now taking on our sin rebellion our uncleanness our un ungodliness our suspicion everything wrong with this woman and everything wrong with you and me and sh and he identified before the world as the worst kind of wolf criminal executed on the cross a a, a death saved for the lowest rung of society and he was willing to do that for you and me and for this woman. She had been rejected, certainly, in the course of life, but the Bible says that he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, so he gets it. But he doesn't just get it. He experienced it and he died to give you and I the victory over it. Right? Jesus was rejected and nailed to a cross so that we could be redeemed. And he rose from the dead, right? And I know not every human being has accepted him. And yet 
He has opened the way for those who have rejected him to turn to him. And you and I that have the grace of God has helped us to come to him in repentance. And what, she, what Jesus offers to this woman is a, a to, for her life and response to life, her response to people to come from a fresh supernatural place. Not from the place of rejection and wrong and hurt and violation and suspicion and cynicism and envy and jealousy and pride and, 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 uh, and, and, and sin. Jesus said, if you, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me to drink, And you would have asked him, he would have given you living water. Whoever drinks of this water will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. God is looking for those to worship him in spirit and in truth, he will say in the next verses. We're talking about eternal life, Holy Spirit life, springing up with inside, like making effective the work of the cross, like what the Father promised in our redemption. Jesus purchased on the cross, and the Spirit of God produces in our lives. Jesus' victory over redemption, red victory over all the sinfulness by which we uh, process our, uh, our uh, issues, right? Uh, all of those things now can be replaced as how we respond to life and people and God and your pastor, and if you're a pastor, to people despite the wrongs that you've experienced. Now that comes, that can come from a supernatural place. It can come. It's not automatic. It can come. That doesn't have to be the thing. The wrongs don't have to be the thing that defines me for the rest of my life. This is now where life comes from, eternal. Not just that you're going to live forever. Everybody's going to live forever. But the quality of life, the life of God himself, the life of Jesus Christ who saw this person in, in all the ways that she was treating him and his, her attitude towards him and offers her eternal life. He asks about her husband, graciously, kindly. She tells him and he says to her, you have spoken truly. That's, that's where it comes down to. Come to him and tell the truth. Tell the truth as the, as the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to see the truth. And say, you know what? It's really not my pastor. Oh, you know, maybe he didn't shake my hand one day. Maybe he was short with me because there were issues of others that he was dealing with. Yeah, all of that stuff can happen. Not, we're all subject to those things. She said, well, you know, I know someday the Messiah is going to come and going to make it right. You know what? You know what, dear lady? That Messiah, he came all of this way to sit at this, at this well for you. He's here for you. And I'll tell you, he's here for you today rejected person, wronged person, pride, envious, prideful, envious, bitter, rebellious person. He is here for you so that you can be free to be wonderfully and gloriously free 
a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. And what does she do? She leaves her water pot and she runs into the city of Samaria and says, come see a man who's told me everything I've ever done. Oh, that'll be interesting. But it, but it, it, but it just, like, come see a man. And I bet she even invited men to come. And because of this powerful revival, a powerful revival. Now, we don't just believe because what you said. Now we believe because we have heard him ourselves. Like, that's the fruit. That's the fruit of a life delivered from transference. To move from transformation, not into transgression, but into transformation. From transference, not to transgression, but to transformation. Let's bow our heads and, and close our eyes this morning.